There's so much more I want to say. You already know he's the most interesting man in Jacksonville. It's written in paper, so we know it's true. And uh, a phenomenal friend, I give you Dr. Wayne Wood. Well, thank you all for coming. We're going to have fun tonight. You know, the camera is like a time machine. It can take you back through time and see things that you could no, never otherwise see. So we are collectively going to get on our little magic bus and go back and look at some of Jacksonville's great buildings of the past and the present and perhaps even the future. Uh, Emily mentioned I started writing this book in uh, 1977. I told people it would be out for Christmas. <laughs> I just didn't tell them which year. <laughs> it took 12 years. But it came, it came out and uh, it is now out of print. We hope to uh, republish the book in the next few years. Uh, I think it was the third leading seller for the University Press of Florida and it's sixth printing. So we'll bring it back. I, I probably won't revise it, but we'll reprint it. But as I was writing this book, I'm not an architect, I'm not really that much an architectural historian. I guess I became one over the course of working on this book. But I would look at a building and say, why is this building important? Why is it interesting? And why should we care? And so let's go back through time and look at Jacksonville building, some of the ones that really stand out. There are some I'm going to leave out tonight and they say, well, why didn't I mention that one or this one? But this is the greatest hits of Jacksonville architecture over the past 500 years. The first recorded image of a building in Duval County, of course, is Dubrai's engravings uh, from uh, Lemoyne's trip to Florida uh, and before Caroline was founded. And so these were simple to move the past, but this is the beginning of Jacksonville architectural heritage. And it's surprising to many people to find out that we have buildings in Jacksonville that were built in the 1700s. Kingsley Plantation is our oldest known building, built in the late 1790s. Uh, was occupied by Zephaniah Kingsley, and it's not just this house, the associated houses um, uh, at Kingsley Plantation. It is a, a national park uh, curated by the National Park Service, and there is this house which was built about 20 years after the main house. It was a kitchen house, sometime called Anna's house. Uh, uh, Kingsley's wife was an African uh, woman who this was considered her house and uh, it is in a remarkable shape after all these hundreds of years. The plantation also features slave cabins, uh, several of which have been reconstructed. The ruins are there are uh, uh, over a dozen. And there's an old barn and other accoutrements that make this one of the best preserved plantations in the entire United States, right here in our backyard. If you've not ever taken a weekend to go out and visit Kingsley Plantation on Fort George Island, it is remarkable. They even have Segway tours you can take. It's quite delightful <laughs> to see the natural vegetation as well as the historical elements. The oldest inhabited dwelling in Duval County, we believe to be this house, it was owned by Francis Richard. Francis Richard uh, came here and got a land grant from the Spanish governor, and it extended all the way from where Jacksonville University is today to Bay Meadows, a nice piece of real estate. And this was his house. And the way we date houses like this is going through uh, letters that make references to it. We went under the house and looked at the saw marks and the types of nails that were built in the foundation. So we date this house in the mid-1840s, the oldest inhabited dwelling. It's near um, Empire Point, uh, where there are several other old houses. This house is nearby in Clifton. And this was a house that Richard sold the property to uh, Zephaniah Kingsley's uh, son, uh, John Sammis, and he built this wooden house. It doesn't look like that today, but the house is still there, as was the previous house. And about 1900, they decided to make this house a little fancier, and so they added the columns. <laughs> this is the original Sammis house uh, out on the point of Clifton. It's a wonderful historic landmark. If you ever drive through Clifton, you should go down to the end and have a look at it. There are other houses that are old. This one is ruins. It's the John Broward Plantation House, built around 1850. You cannot access this right now. It's in the middle of a swamp. Uh, it is not quite in good condition now as it was when this picture was taken 
about 70 years ago. This was called Cedar Point Plantation. The Broward family owned all the property north of the Trout River Bridge to the Nassau County line and almost all the way to Fort George Island. Those Spanish land grants were really cool, 20, 25 square miles. And the Broward family gradually multiplied. They were probably the largest family in Florida. And they all argued about the land over all those years. And some of it got sold off, and some of them are still arguing about the land even as I speak. <laughs> Here is the first hotel that I have a picture of in Jacksonville. This was built in 1865. A woman named Eliza Hudnall uh, was a very industrious person. She was from the South, but when the Yankees invaded, and they did invade Jacksonville four different times during the Civil War, she realized she should make a profit off this war, and so she would row her boat out to the incoming Union soldiers and sell them biscuits and food and, and drink. And uh, then she, immediately after the war, she opened a hotel for the occupying Union forces. This was the St. John's House down on Bay Street. And there's an interesting article in this current issue of Jackson Magazine about Eliza Hedenall that uh, includes this picture of St. John's House. It was sort of a boarding house, but she called it a hotel, and that's, that will give credit for being a hotel. <coughs> Along with commercial structures, we want to look at residential structures. I found it interesting as I went through the different decades of Jacksonville history to see what styles of architecture were, were built and where did the rich people live? What, what were the biggest houses in Jacksonville? This was the house of Colonel Sanderson, John Sanderson, and uh, he was a Confederate and uh, he had probably the biggest house in Jacksonville uh, built around 1860 or before. It was there when the Civil War started. Because when the Yankees came in and occupied the city, they occupied his house and made it the Union Army headquarters because it was the fanciest house uh, and it was just a few blocks from the river. Now here we are on Bay Street and you notice the river is in the foreground. At that point, Bay Street was on the river. It faced the river. And this is one of the uh, big mercantile buildings that faced on Bay Street uh, that was built well before the war. I don't know the exact date of it. You can look in the background and see Sanderson's house, the roof of it sticking up back here, and the lone Union Sentinel out watching. He's, he's a Union soldier, of course, during the occupation. He's looking down the river to see if he can sound the alarm and his southern boats come up to try to uh, retake the city. Here you see another view of the same building. And this is Ocean Street right here today. So, you know, one of the things about history that people you lose their interest is it's about wars and dead people. I mean, that, that history gets a bad rap. The reason I'm excited about history is because it tells us what happened here at a given time, what makes this place what it is. And this is Bay Street and Ocean Street. You can go down there on the way home and you can see that spot. You can be in that spot. You can be part of what made our city what it is today. Now, there were churches. This is the Methodist Church built in the 1840s. And it, it existed. The Union soldiers took this over too and used it after the war as part of the Freedmen's Bureau. And uh, it's interesting to see that awkward sort of architecture. Here's the Presbyterian Church. You notice neither of these have very impressive steeples. I guess the most impressive steeple belonged to the Baptist Church, as you see here. And the Yankees took over the steeple and made it into a watchtower so they could see the boats coming down the river. In fact, this was just a minor watchtower. There were at least three other watchtowers uh, one of which was at Mayport, one was at, uh, 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 right across from St. John's Bluff, and the other was in the middle of what is today Emmett Park. And here you see a little house up on top of this watchtower. What do you think that was up there for? Because when the Confederate uh, snipers started shooting at him, they had some place to duck into. Here we see Stamp Institute built immediately after the war. The, the, after the war, of course, the carpetbaggers came in, uh, reconstruction took place, and uh, the uh, African American population uh, was administered to out of this school, which was a school. And they also had another, they had a Freedmen's Bureau and a Provost Marshal's office they used to administer to the newly freed black citizens. James Weldon Johnson, our 
probably one of the most famous people to ever live in Jacksonville, was principal of the school later on. Here you see the Freedmen's Bureau with an amazing mansard roof, very uh, stately architecture, very uh, sophisticated for a town like Jacksonville. And you have to realize that during the war, Jacksonville was, in, it was occupied four times. When the Yankee soldiers left each of those four times, they of course burned out the town and destroyed everything you could use. So when the Confederates came back, and then they had to leave, they burned it down again. So at the end of the war, Jacksonville was a mess. So buildings like this begin to take over our downtown area to give it a, a little bit of a cosmopolitan flavor. And after the war, Jacksonville came back very quickly. Uh, such notables as Harriet Beecher Stowe, who President Abraham Lincoln called the little woman who started the Civil War, for her famous book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. She uh, had this stately residence out in Mandarin, uh, built around this huge live oak tree you see over here. And that is her husband, Calvin, and I would believe that is probably Harriet right there. Uh, along with uh, the, the carpetbaggers came Yankees. You have to realize Jackson was occupied by Union troops four different times. Before that, we had Seminole Wars where we had federal troops. And so all these soldiers went home back up to Pennsylvania, New York, and Connecticut, and New Jersey, and they told their friends about this cool place they'd been in service where they had beautiful weather, had an ocean, had a majestic river, they had hair hanging from the trees, <laughs> giant lizards swimming in the river. It was cool. So by 1869, Jacksonville has gone from this torn up, dirty, little bombed out town to a tourist destination. The uh, big steamships came down to Jacksonville, and this was the first of the big hotels to be built in Jacksonville during the tourist era. And this was built just four years after, after the war ended. 1869, the Great St. James Hotel opened, facing on what is now Hemming Park. Then it was called City Park. Later, they renamed it St. James Park because of the big hotel. And uh, during the 1870s, you could stroll through the park and hear the strains of the St. James Orchestra playing in the evening twilight. And in the guest book, you would see the signatures of the Astors and the Vanderbilts and the royalty of Europe. They came to Jackson, not just for a weekend, but they would come and stay for a month during the season, as they call it. Jacksonville's population would double in the wintertime because it was truly the tourist mecca for the entire Easter season. Here you see an interesting picture, uh, and this is a fairly ordinary mercantile building, but it's significant in that it was probably the Walmart of the day. You could buy anything here, groceries, feed, uh, hardware. And the owner of the store was the man you see at the left. His name was Peter Jones. Peter Jones was called the carpet batter mayor. He was elected mayor six different times. He was also elected the fire chief. He ran the major business in town and controlled the commerce. They also called him 10% Peter because he was a little bit corrupt. <laughs> and here you see a, a lovely hotel. This is a new image I just got. It was a hotel I didn't know much about, but it was one of the first hotels built after the fire, the Mackler House, a lovely uh, a gingerbread three-story hotel that was down on Bay Street. And one of the other big hotels was the Grand National, which was down on, further down on Bay Street. Uh, if you remember where Sears and Roebuck used to be, that's where this hotel stood. It was later renamed the Everett, and then they added a wing onto it called the Aragon. The Aragon Hotel uh, survived up until the 1950s. The brick building. Here's another of the famous hotels, the Windsor. This also faced on Henry Park. Uh, on Hogan Street, and it was a rival, particularly with the St. James, they were both uh, very large in size and catered to northern travelers. This is an interesting building on Bay Street. It was called Todney's Billiard Parlor and Opera House. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Look, right here. So upstairs was the Opera House. We're talking about sophistication here, folks. This is Jacksonville. And upstairs was the Opera House. There we go. Another of the uh, wonderful hotels that were smaller in scale but still had a great reputation among northern visitors was the Tremont House. And then this guy, after the war, came. He was one of the flood of northerners who came here. His name was Frank.
Francis E. Spinner. He was a secretary of the treasurer under Abraham Lincoln, and he was in poor health, and so he came to Florida uh, shortly after the war to uh, mend his health. And uh, because he was secretary of the treasury, he had to sign all of the money, many of which he signed by hand, not rubber stamp like they do today. Abraham Lincoln said, Spinner, your signature is so ornate, nobody could ever counterfeit the money. That's a signature. <laughs> He lived in a house on Riverside Avenue where the Times Union editorial office is today. And it looked like this. You see a windmill, St. John's River in the background, right across from the burrito gallery today. <laughs> and uh, by the way, that is General Spinner sitting right there. He later uh, moved out to the beach and set up a tent village where he lived out the remainder of his life until he died. Now, associated with General Spinner, we also had a resident here who was the widow of Abraham Lincoln. Mary Todd Lincoln came to Jacksonville and stayed in this hotel, which was just about 400 feet from where General Spinner lived. So I'm sure there was some connection with why she came to Jacksonville uh, after her husband died to recuperate. And she lived here for over a month. And the unique thing about this house, oh, by the way, after the month was up, her sons put her in a insane asylum in Ohio uh, <laughs> to keep her out of trouble. But anyway, uh, this house is said to have ghosts because it still exists. In 1911, it was put on a barge and moved from, again, about where the Times Union is today, down to Riverside on River Boulevard uh, at uh, Goodwin Street. And there it sits today, the oldest. Uh, Tourist-related building still remain in Jacksonville. This was built in 1867. It still exists today as the last of the great hotels of Jacksonville. The roof has been the porch closed in, but it's still remarkable to see something that's so uh, out, of, out of time, out of chronology. Now, as you, as you know, if you travel here, every time you go to a little village, the biggest building in the town is the cathedral because the church has the money and they want to make God happy and build something beautiful. And so that was not untrue in Jacksonville. Here in the 1880s, the Episcopal built one of the most magnificent edifices uh, that existed in downtown Jacksonville before the fire. Uh, most of these buildings I'm showing you now, of course, burned in the fire. Uh, one of the buildings that did not burn, though, was Old St. Luke's Hospital. Then it was called New St. Luke's Hospital, or just St. Luke's Hospital. It was built in 1878, the very first true hospital in the, in the state of Florida, 1878. And it had a wing on the side, and they added another wing. Those got demolished uh, over time, but the original building is still there. It is now the headquarters for the Jacksonville Historical Society Archives. If you've never been through there, you should go make an appointment and go through and have an amazing uh, collection of Jacksonville memorabilia and history. And this is over on just the other side of the arena. The Jacksonville Historical Society has four buildings. This house, the Merrill House next door. And then on the other side of the arena, we have two more houses, the Old St. Luke Hospital and the Old Casket Factory, which is a story for another time. <laughs> so, um, follow the money. Who was the richest person in town? Her name was Martha Mitchell. She was the sister of the governor. And over on the south bank of the river, she got a huge estate. Uh, it was called Villa Alexandria. And this is her house. The house itself was not imposing, but it was the site of all the parties and fundraisers. Uh, in fact, old, she was very much um, in charge of raising money for old Saint, for St. Louis Hospital to help build the thing. And so they had many parties there. People would go over there on the boat. And here's another picture of it. You can see it, it has this nice gingerbread filigree. But she was the richest lady in town. And that was her house. And now, by the way, that is now San Marco. Oh, uh, San Marco. Yeah. <laughs> kind of that downtown, one of the most uh, elegant uh, citizens of Jacksonville was Dr. Abel Seymour Baldwin, who the town of Baldwin was named after. He's the one that uh, lobbied and got the jetties. He was the only doctor at one time, and he would ride on horseback around and study the river. And uh, he, uh, when he died in the 1880s, his house uh, on Newman Street uh, was 
considered one of the landmark mansions. Another mansion was that of uh, S.B. Hubbard, who was a hardware magnate and uh, entrepreneur, and uh, his house was this mansard roof. You can see Jackson had some pretty sophisticated architecture back then. Probably the most fabulous of all the houses from the Victorian era was Maribyrnong. Uh, this was formerly called Curly Place, uh, owned by D.G. Amber, the big banker in town. It burned down, and he sold it to a, a series of owners. Uh, some used it as a, 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 a hospital for uh, uh, sick people from the north. It was owned by several uh, prominent feminist suffragettes, uh, as well as a notable astronomer, Dr. Suvier. And it's still there today in all of its magnificent glory, and I believe it's for sale. Uh, I think you can get a 10% discount if you have your jacket for a star. <laughs> uh, you let me know, okay? Here's a great house. You may have seen this out Fort George Island. This was owned, uh, built in the 1880s by uh, Napoleon Bonaparte Broward, part of the famous Broward family. He went on to become governor. He was famous for running guns to Cuba during the Spanish-American War. And his house was a prominent cupola, so he could look out in the ocean. He was also a tugboat pilot, so he could see the boats coming in and escort them over the sandbar in St. John's. It's now a part of the uh, uh, Kingsley Plantation uh, Preserve. One of the truly greatest hotels ever built in Jacksonville was the Murray Hall Hotel, built out at Abba Beach. Later became Jacksonville Beach. Uh, like many hotels, this towering edifice attracted northerners. It was imposing like a castle. Of course, it was lit by, illuminated by gas. And can you imagine having a wooden hotel lit by gas with ocean breezes? I don't think there's a single wooden hotel on the East Coast that still survives because they burned so, so readily. But it was quite a, a thing to stay. There were two hotels at Fort George Island. Here's a picture of one of them. Uh, this existed, uh, it was about built in the early 1880s and it burned down within a few years, same problem. One of the uh, truly most awesome buildings ever built in Jacksonville was the Subtropical Exposition. Now Jacksonville was a tourist destination. By 1880s, the late 1880s, Henry Flagler had built his railroad not to Jacksonville, but through Jacksonville, down to St. Augustine and Palm Beach, and finally down to Key West, taking tourists away from Jacksonville further south. So the city fathers decided they would build a sort of a world's fair. It would be called a subtropical exposition. And this would showcase all the wonders of Florida and attract tourists from all over. In fact, it did attract the president of the United States, Grover Cleveland, the second fattest president we ever had. So <laughs> the city rolled out the carpet. It was amazing. And, and the, the people wanted to see not just him, but his, his bride. He had just gotten married. To an 18 year old woman. It was quite a scandal. He got married in the White House. He was in his uh, late 30s, and she was the daughter of his law partner who died. He was her guardian. And there you go. So I turned out to see her. And, but the fair lasted for a few years. It only was open during the wintertime uh, with all those windows. I'm sure it was very hot inside. And then we had a, a series of yellow fever epidemics, which doomed us to closing. It was torn down. But one of the buildings that still does exist, of course, is the building we're in today, uh, built in the 1880s by a very prominent architect from Fernandina uh, named Robert Skyler. Uh, this is, again, one of those towering Episcopal churches. Uh, again, the Episcopals had a knock on building elegant, huge buildings, and uh, they have always been quite a presence in Jacksonville. We're very proud of this building, uh, which was vacant for over 25 years. Many of the windows were broken out. Uh, the Jacksonville Star Society raised a fundraising campaign assisted by Dolores Barr Weaver. Her first year here in Jacksonville, she had to drive by this church every day to go to Jaguar Stadium. And she said, we're going to help fix that. And she was, she was an angel helping us to restore and uh, maintain this beautiful church. Next door, you'll see this house, which was also built in the 1880s or maybe before. We have some clues that the central part of this house was built 10 or 15 years earlier. It's the Merrill House, and this is truly one of the great house museums in the entire southeastern United States. 
And you can go on the Jacksonville Historical Society website and find out how to get a tour of that house next door. It wasn't always next door, it was down the street. And uh, it was a terrible condition when it got moved twice. Once over here, and they built a baseball stadium, and they moved it back over there. But it's still there, and we're sure proud of it. It's a beautiful Victorian uh, residence that's decorated to the era of 1901. But the most outrageous house ever built in Jacksonville was on Riverside Avenue, and then with Brooklyn, um, right about, let's see, where Preston Haskell built his town. This was originally a two-story wooden farmhouse, and uh, it was lived in by Melvin Greeley, the famous architect, when he was a little boy. He went off to school and came back, and his father had turned it over to a carpenter who built this incredible six-story monstrosity of gingerbread and a uh, wood turned heart. And uh, it somehow inspired Melvin Greeley to become an architect. Probably the most fabulous business building built before the Great Fire of 1901 was the Astro. This very impressive three-story business building on the river at Hogan Street uh, was one of the few large buildings to survive the 1901 fire. It was built by Commodore Astor, who also founded the Yacht Club, because he had the only yacht in town, so he built the Yacht Club. <laughs> the architect for Old St. Luke's Hospital, for Martha Mitchell's Villa Alexandria, and this building were all the same architect, George Hoover. Another of the big business buildings in downtown was the Mohawk building, which burned twice, and then the third time it burned, it was in the Great Fire Act, but there was nothing left. But it was one of the uh, prominent business buildings. And by 1880s, we needed a new county courthouse. Originally, the court met under a tree down on Bay Street, and they built a smaller wooden building. And this was their effort to build a building uh, with walls so thick it could protect all the records and could withstand any disaster. So they thought. Uh, mid 1890, we have a new city hall with a towering turret and the steeple in the middle. The entrance there you see goes into an open courtyard where they had open market vegetable market. And you can go in and buy your fruits and vegetables in the um, area of the courthouse. We also built an armory made with limestone bricks that melted like a popsicle. Fire. Also, in the mid 1890s, we're building a new federal courthouse and post office. Here you see the early stage of construction. This marble clad building is really awesome. And from this tower, this building survived the fire also, amazingly. From that tower, many of the pictures of the panorama of the disaster of the Great Fire were taken from here because it was the tallest building not just in Jackson, but in Florida. Here you see uh, an early commercial building. We built with, again, very urban sophistication. This was a Cone Firstkits, the early Firstkits department store, was in this building on Forsyth Street. And Barnett Bank opened their bank in this uh, wonderfully uh, classical uh, building. It also survived the fire. People think all of Jackson was burned down. Well, from where the Ritz Theater is today, all the way to Hogan's Creek, all the way to Springfield, on the edge of Hogan's Creek, all the way just a few blocks from here, the fire burned. But late in the afternoon, about 8 o'clock at night, they finally put out the fire at the corner of Adams and Laura Street. So a number of buildings, including the few I just showed you in this building, survived the fire and were there after the fire was over. This was the home of Mr. Barnett in Springfield, safely across Hogan's Creek, so it's still there today. One of the beautiful mansions in Springfield. And uh, it's, it's hard to tell from the records whether this was completed before the fire or right after the fire. I've heard stories that Mr. Barnett sat up on the balcony and watched Jacksonville burn in the distance. <laughs> this little house uh, was built in 1893 for a man named Rickard, who was the uh, franchise of the Coca-Cola Company and also a, a liquor dealer. And uh, that building still survives because it was in Riverside way far away from the fire. And one of the other extraordinary landmarks that still exist is the fort that was built during the Spanish-American War out of St. John's Bluff. There were two large 20-foot uh, cannons that were placed in the center of these rotating tracks so they could guard the St. John's River in case the Spanish Armada uh, 
dared to come in and try to capture this in the John River. So after the fire, most of the, most people lived downtown, most of the businesses were downtown, most of the churches were downtown. So there was this immediate renaissance of building. People came from all over the country to get a piece of the action. And the first building completed after the Great Fire was, who knows what it is? The Continental Hotel at the Beach. It was, it was, it was already under construction. And this was completed and opened its doors one month after the Great Fire of Jacksonville and lasted for, uh, I think, another 19 years before it too burned. So like most great hotel in the world. But in downtown Jacksonville, the first major edifice was the Windsor Hotel. Uh, it not only rebuilt itself, the fire was in May, May 3rd. By February the 1st, this building opened. In that short of time, they planned, designed, and built this building and opened its doors. And they also did a clever thing. They bought the lot across the park from them where the former St. James Hotel had been so that no competitor could buy that lot. <laughs> and that's why that lot stayed vacant until uh, about 1909 when the Cohen brothers bought it and built their refused to park store there. Uh, one of the first uh, tall buildings built in Jacksonville was the Dial-Up Church building. This was designed by a young architect named Henry Cluthen. He read about the fire in, in the New York Times. He was 28 years old, just started his practice. And he said, I think I'm going to go there and rebuild that town. This was his first building, which was started about three months after the Great Fire. He also designed the City Hall with its great copper dome. This is on site with Hayden Burns Library, the DuPont Center is today. And he also got the commission to design the library. Again, you see these buildings are fairly classical, neoclassical with column. But Clutho was an artist and very innovative. And in the tops of the capitals, he put people of learning Shakespeare, Euclid, uh, Herodotus, and, and other great uh, people of learning, which was appropriate for a column that you walk past when you go into the free public. He did not get the commission for this. This was designed by one of his rivals, but it was the um, uh, city's courthouse. And of course, we needed a fire station because most all the fire stations were outside of fire area. The fire station downtown burned, and that was rebuilt. And this fire station number two was built on Catherine Street and was moved over to uh, what is, is now uh, the shipyards and is. Great, great fire museum. It's currently closed for renovation. It's one of the great fire museums in England. So here we go. Great cathedral for the Catholics built this with immaculate conception, burned in the fire. Uh, and this is truly one of the great Gothic cathedrals in all of Florida. And then the Presbyterians got their, their chance to have this big, beautiful limestone and sandstone building that has uh, been remodeled since that picture was taken. It has a different roof line on it. It's still one of the great churches. And the great Bethel Baptist Church in uh, uh, the Women's Creek. So these are just some of the sophisticated architectural trends going on. And I hope you see as we go through these that Jackson has a pretty neat architecture. But the Episcopalians will always pull out all the stop. Here <laughs> <laughs> my body. So they hired some New York architects, Stelly and Powell, to design this thing. And although it's not as large and imposing as some of the other churches we just saw. Its architectural details are just so exquisite with uh, gargoyles and uh, cast stone and carved stone. And you may have seen in the announcement for this program that I, I love this little play where you have this evil gargoyle coming out and sneering at the little angel on the roof at that same church. <coughs> and you got your cow, <laughs> bird, your frogs, Go study this building. It is crazy. It's got the most wonderful stonework you've ever had. Uh, this building was a Seminole Club, one of the oldest men's clubs in the United States at the time it was built. Teddy Roosevelt made a speech on the porch. Uh, originally, it was two stories. They outgrew it very quickly and uh, added the third story within a few years. And it still is there, of course. The old Florida National Bank was sometimes called the Marble Bank. It was part of this renaissance of architecture in Jacksonville, bringing all these northern architectural influences to this sleepy southern town, as Jacksonville almost overnight, within a decade after the fire, became one of the most modern cities in the United States because it had all the latest architectural fashions and it got to start with it to Kansas. 
There were wonderful residents of these along Ashley Street at uh, Julia, some of the prominent, this was Senator Tolliver's house, I believe. And the TV Porter Mansion was one of those that still exists today. This uh, was designed by Clutho in a very classical style for one of the uh, leaders of the business community, TV Porter. And uh, it is now the headquarters for one of our top architecture firms, KDJ. Out of Riverside, which totally escaped the fire, a lot of the wealthy people who live downtown decided to get out of the rat race of living downtown, the dangers, the clutter, the traffic. And so they moved out to Riverside. And uh, by night, between 1901 and 1910, there were over 50 mansions like this built on Riverside Avenue. Uh, and it was at one time called the most beautiful street in America. Uh, the people who lived there called it the Row. <laughs> Sadly, only two of these houses still exist that were all torn down. But you get to see some of the magnificent houses. This was the home of Mayor Bowden. He was the mayor during the Great Fire of Jacksonville. That's about where the Riverside Arts Market is today. And here's the house of the Cummers, the wealthy lumber magnates from Michigan who came here in the 1890s and built three homes actually side by side. This was the home of Episcopal Bishop Edwin Weed. Uh, my grandmother uh, bought this house. Um, 1931, and my brother and I always thought they were so rich because they had this big house, and we could, my brother and I could not reach our arms around the column that they were sitting in. She would have 65 people for dinner. It was a boarding house. <laughs> they were exactly the opposite of rich, but I love that old house, and sad it was torn down in the late 1960s for a one-story brick insurance building. Oh. That many fond memories of Bradley Brown. Another surprising edifice that many people don't know about is the old YWCA, based on Hemming Park. Uh, this four and a half story building uh, lasted until the 1950s. This was the YWCA in Jackson. Now this building doesn't look like anything you've seen in my slideshow so far. This is a reinforced concrete and steel building, which was a totally revolutionary construction type. This building starts going up around 1907. And, uh, this was the first reinforced concrete steel building in Florida. Maybe in the south. Uh, the reinforced concrete no longer relies on brick walls to hold up the building. So you can have big windows, you can have ornamentation, decoration. And uh, that building became the YMCA. It was uh, one of Pluto's first experiments with reinforced concrete. And the first had a Chicago style windows, which you see here. Pluto was Right, young man, and uh, in 1905, he went on his honeymoon to Niagara Falls, which was important. Uh, he had a beautiful young wife, and he talked her into letting him go over to Buffalo nearby, where this upstart young architect named Frank Lloyd Wright was designing two of his greatest buildings the Larkin Building and the Darwin Art House. And Clutho went over and spent the afternoon with Frank Lloyd Wright. He came back to Jacksonville, energized, excited about this new American architecture that was going to take over the landscape of America. And so he built his, he designed his own home on Main Street in this new, very abstract uh, style of architecture that's now called the Prairie Style, with large windows, uh, bands of windows, large overhanging eaves that protect uh, the, the windows in the summertime and allow cool breezes to go through in the winter. In the summer. So there's his house. As it originally faced on Main Street, it later got moved around to 9th Street, but it's still there today. And the owners of that are in the audience. And congratulations on living in Clutho's house. Jeffrey yeah. Carroll. So here's Clutho's first attempt to really build a skyscraper. It's called the Bisbee Building. Tall and thin and soaring. Many of you know that Frank Lloyd Wright is the most famous architect there ever lived. But his mentor and teacher was Louis Sullivan, who was the greatest architect. <laughs> Louis Sullivan was the father of the skyscraper. He came to Chicago right after the big fire in Chicago and figured out how to make buildings not only that were tall, but that were soaring and beautiful and reached up to the sky, so they called them skyscrapers. So here, Clutho designs the first skyscraper for Jackson. It's not just six or seven stories tall, it's eight, nine, I've got a nosebleed, 11 stories! Can you believe it? 
They couldn't get insurance on it because they didn't think it would stand up if I could fall right over the Disney bill. But not only did it stand up, it was a marvel. Everybody talked about it. That is Clutho standing right up there on top. I have a whole series of these pictures. Every time they built a story, he would go up and stand in the picture with a little man in the derby hat. And so when the building was finished in 1908 or 1909, it was fully rented before it even finished. So Mr. Bisbee told Clutho, double it. And so, in a marvelous architectural trick, Clutho doubled the building. Here's the original building, ready to be opened. He adds this in record time. And so now the Bisbee building, instead of being a tall, thin skyscraper, is a tall, not quite so thin skyscraper, but nonetheless the first skyscraper in Florida. And it's still there on Forsyth Street. Clutho made his architectural statement even stronger on Main Street, where next to his house, which is this one, originally there was a little naked nymph in a niche here in front, just to chat people off as they drove down Main Street. <laughs> it was conservative. The <coughs> next building builds Clutho Parks, which are still there in the original location, which is a magnificent work of art. I've called this Jacksonville's greatest outdoor work of art. Just the rhythm and the symmetry of the building uh, with this gold. Leaf Frank Lloyd Wright style tree of light windows, cantilever balconies is a wonder to behold. And thank goodness it's still there. Rita Reagan, who's been a long time member of the Historical Society, was instrumental in saving that building. Here you see something gold leaf window, just priceless. Clues have also went on to design other buildings in this style. This is the Claude Mellon Cadillac building, uh, which no longer looks like this, but part of the structure is still there. Here's the criminal court building, which was, was torn down to about six parking spaces for police cars. With these big plate glass windows flooded the courtroom with light, wonderful Sullivan esque type one uh, uh, address the building. Another one was created, a clever building in the same style, was the Morocco Temple, uh, kind of Egyptian, kind of mimicking Frank Lloyd Wright's Unity Temple in Chicago. Many of you may know that building. But sadly, in the 1950s, the cornice went back. This thing that made the whole composition make sense. This horizontal number got removed. And one of my goals is before I die is to talk and, and put it back up. Yeah. It'll make the composition He built another building uh, for the Germania Club. He was German. And uh, he was a member of the Germania Club. He built this wonderful building out of Riverside Avenue about where the YMCA is today, uh, using some of these same architectural features, see the bands and windows, wonderfully placed ornamentation. One of his great downtown buildings was the Seminole Hotel. Many of you all stayed there, went to parties there. This was torn down in the late 70s. Uh, it was on the corner of Hogan and Forsyth. And there was a series of Indian heads right along here. If you go to the uh, Ed Ball building, they have one of these on display in the Museum of Science and History also has one. There they go. There were originally ten Indians and four eagles. I have one of the eagles and three of the Indians. So, by 1911, Clutho is just going gangbusters. He's got dozens of buildings he's building all at the same time, and he strikes his masterpiece of the skyscraper. The Florida Light Building, which faces on Laura Street. Not only did this embody everything that Louis Sullivan wanted to do with the skyscraper, it's tall and thin and soaring and reaching up into the sky, uh, but its slender profile made it a wonder to behold. And it was crowned up at the top by this uh, amazing terracotta ornamentation that has seashells and leaves and just a, a very amazing abstract design. Unfortunately, in the 1980s, the nation's bank, which owned the building, tore those off. A small fleck of material fell off in a, a windstorm, and they demolished Jacksonville's great work of art. And I led a protest out in the middle of Mars Street. We had over 100 people, and I burned the nation's bank credit card. <laughs> and they demolished it. <laughs> but Pluto's greatness was yet to be shown. His magnum opus, his masterpiece, was the St. James Building, the ninth largest department store in the United States. Uh, it embodied 
Louis Sullivan, Frank Lloyd Wright's architectural ideal in one large building filled the block that had formerly housed the St. James Hotel, hence the name the St. James Building. But the feature of it was the Cold Brothers department store, the big store. Here you've got all this uh, European fashion and sophistication that no other store in Jacksonville provided. It was based on Hinton Park and truly was the center of the city, even though it was four blocks from the river and uh, six or eight blocks from the city government. It was, in short term, an architect, architectural and artistic masterpiece. And it embodies all this design, which was, was out of the playbook of Louis Sullivan. He, he originated this ornamentation that combines geometric figures, seed pods, leaves, and things that make a stone building have more of an organic feel, a human scale to it. And the St. James is still a masterpiece. The interior was lit by this 80-foot skylight held up by these atlas-like figures which have been replicated in the restoration very, very poorly, but I have become king or emperor, I don't know if you may have to replace every one of those with something decent. Clutha died in his 90s. He was truly our city's greatest artist of all times. Six people came to his funeral. His memory was forgotten for many years. He's been providing the course of recent times. And he designed many buildings. He was German. So after World War II, World War I, his, his practice went away. The Germans were not popular. The prairie style nationwide uh, went into uh, recession. It did not become the dominant American architecture that Frank Lloyd Wright had envisioned. So, so, uh, so Clutho went on to design many wonderful buildings like this one, that church building, on St. John's Avenue at uh, Mallory Street. Wasn't that something? What's going on? That sure is an amazing building. And other architects, besides Clutho, took out the prairie style. Here you see a wonderful uh, six-story skyscraper on Main Street uh, using some of the prairie style features. The Chicago windows uh, was by another architect in Camp. And two of uh, Clutho's proteges, Mark and Sheffield, designed many prairie style buildings, including the Black Masonic Temple. This little jewel box at the Black Masonic Temple on Broad Street is one of the great prairie style buildings in the South. I love it. And Clutho didn't design this either, but in 1911, a guy named Hurd, the owner of the Hurd National Bank, decided he would build the tallest building in Florida. And so this was Hurd National Bank, later became the Florida Title Building. Uh, and the giant columns that you see on the front of it here are now um, in the um, Times Union Center. Those big columns that go nowhere you see sitting up there. They came off this building when they tore it up. There were many wonderful theaters. Here's the Strand Theater over in the Villa section, uh, catered to African American audiences. Uh, quite a jovial, exciting building. And the great uh, neoclassical columns of the Jackson train station completed in 1919. The architect of this was a New York architect. And he thought that they were rubes here in Jacksonville, but never noticed. So he totally cribbed the facade from Penn Central Station. If you look at the picture of Penn Central, they have it here. But you'll, you'll see it looks exactly the same. He thought nobody would notice. <laughs> <laughs> well, Penn Central Station got demolished. At least we still have our great train station. Uh, and one of the great towering edifices of, of entertainment and architecture is the Florida Theater, which just had its 90th birthday. Uh, online there is a, a nice little documentary video that I helped make about the history of this building. It's the love of all we all. Uh, I remember going to the movies there at some time in our life and now it is Jackson's premier arts and entertainment venue. And we must not forget the roller coaster built at the beach in 1928, went through many variations, torn down in the 50s, was one of the great architectural triumphs in Jackson. The first big amusement park long before Mickey Mouse came to Florida. We got the thrill of the big wood roller. Mansions. Again, follow them. Who were the rich people? Leon Cheek, founder of the Maxwell House Coffee Company, built his mansion, this uh, castle like structure on the River Boulevard. Just the opposite end of the River Boulevard from the old hotel from the time. And the other wealthy, this was the biggest house in uh, all of Jacksonville, was built the, the Lane Mansion built in 
to the revival style. Mrs. Lane had her great garden parties to the women's club on the lawn there on Richmond Street. Over in San Jose, there was ambition to build a, a city larger than Jacksonville called San Jose. And uh, this is all sort of European type architecture, the prairie style fizzled out. Now we're seeing tile roofs, uh, stucco walls, stone ornamentation, trying to kind of take on the attributes of Italy and, and uh, Greece and, and the Spain and the Mediterranean area. And so this architecture of the 1920s is often called Mediterranean Revival. And the San Jose Hotel was one of the great examples of that. This building opened uh, on the first day of 1926. And by 1927, the Florida land bust had happened, foreshadowing the uh, national stock market crash, and it closed. Years later, it was turned into a uh, military academy, and today is Bowles School, one of the most beautiful high schools in America. Another Mediterranean revival house nearby was about the other richest person in town, the DuPonts, who built Epic Forest, which is, this was their home. Uh, it was on the side of what was planned to be the second San Jose Hotel, but of course it never came out. Uh, another Mediterranean house in Ortega is La Cedros on Ortega Boulevard, mm -hmm. said to be modeled after uh, El Greco's house in Spain. Here you see a close up of it. And the greatest Mediterranean revival triumph of all is Addison Rising of Riverside Baptist Church. Uh, Meisner was not a man of God, but he promised his mother on her deathbed that he would build a church. And so as this church started to go up, he, he charged to the congregation, and they quickly realized this didn't look like a Baptist church, it looked like a Roman Catholic cathedral. <laughs> and they said a third of the congregation left. Which is, today they now adore it, embrace it, and it is truly one of the great Mediterranean Bible buildings in Jacksonville and in Florida. Clues that have this one long after his prairie style years. Love the Gibbs House on Oak Street. And all these are prairie style. I'm sorry, it's Mediterranean Revival. <coughs> a little bit of European influence in this marble house on the corner of Riverside. Truly one of the great um, industrial buildings ever built in Jackson, the Ford Motor Company plant, which today is under the Matthew Bridge, which is hard to see. But uh, this was designed by Henry Ford's own architect, Al Khan, which was. He did uh, more buildings for Henry Ford than anybody else. And of course, we've got, as we go into the 1930s and 40s, we have Hines Airport built in our deco style. Kind of notice we're in chronological order here, and we get fewer and fewer great buildings as time goes by. Here is one of the few great mansions built in the 1930s um, out on Seminole Road Beach. In the 1940s, we have NAS going up. Albert Kahn, Henry Ford's architect, comes back to Jacksonville and builds the um, uh, assembly plant out of NAS in very much an Art Deco style. And it had, was said to have had it, the largest door of any building in the South. By the 1960s, we have come a long way. I'm sorry, by the 1950s. After World War II, young architects come to Jacksonville. Bob Brower, Taylor Harder, Bill Morgan and others all helped up about new technology, concrete construction. And so they start designing houses that are radical for anything we've ever seen. This is the Butterfly House over off the Arlington Expressway, built in the 1950s, 1957, by Bob Brower's early commissions, with the roof that the water drains off and turns into a fountain, built very simple materials, but expressing the creativity of the wonderful possibilities of concrete. As did uh, Taylor Hardwick, architect, who designed the Hayden Burns Library in the mid 1960s. At the time, it was the most modern building in Jacksonville. Fifty years later, everyone wanted to tear it down because it was ugly and kitsch. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, we started thinking about it. And said, "Well, you know, that's pretty cool. I would bet that a hundred years from now, when architectural stories come to Jacksonville, they will want to see the St. James Building, the Hayden Burns Library, and the Gulf Life Tower." which are three internationally recognized structures in the future. Taylor Harbor also designed a friendship fountain across the river. And here you see the original design before they cut it up with the circular fountain, the pump house, the uh, promenade, and this little building, which was the harbor master's uh, 
And there is a pump house that comes to shape like a snail. And the harbor masters had that torn down to build a restaurant there uh, across from Mosh. I love that book. I just I wish we still had that. Maybe someday somebody will find a reason to rebuild it. Truly one of the great modern Mississippi modern buildings in Jacksonville is the Gulf Light Building. We go by every day and don't notice. This is recognized as one of the ten great pre-stressed, post-tension concrete buildings in the world. It's on the National Register of Concrete Buildings and is unique because of, uh, if you notice, the building is built on these vertical members and there's no post or column holding up the corner. They're all cantilevered off. And it's built to withstand a 150 mile hurricane. And it's a unique geometry that is still remarkable. Bob Brown also designed uh, a church, the Unitarian Church off of Arlington Expressway, which is, he considered one of his masterpieces built into nature, part of the environment. Uh, the interior is looking up to the sky and to the body of water behind the pulpit. Here's a gas station on Roosevelt Boulevard, and by Taylor Hardwick, sadly, no longer there. I love that thing. Out of Ponte Vedra, there were some wonderful houses built. This one was still a mile house designed by international renowned architect Paul Rudolph. And uh, it's still there. And another private building was the Jake House out of Padgett's Pass, Queens Harbor, built around several trees. And then uh, Blake Ellis' wonderful uh, St. Paul by the Sea out of the beach. It's a truly remarkable work of mid century modern architecture. Sadly, this building was designed by the most famous architect who ever designed one of the Jacksonville, Bruce Goff, who was a protege of Frank Lloyd Wright. This building was off Old San Jose Boulevard. Uh, it was called Butterfly House. And it was one of his favorite houses. The walls had uh, wine bottles on the walls so the light shone through the different colored wine bottles. And the uh, slam had been tore this down back in the 70s to build a new mansion. Here's one of Bob Howard's great houses. It's kind of magic. This is the Klein House uh, with these cantilevered balconies sticking out over 40 feet. Bill Morgan was another architect at the same time who came to Jacksonville um, and uh, was originally a Jacksonville citizen, came back here and is now renowned throughout the world. All three of those architects, Taylor Hardwick, Bob Howard, and, and Bill Morgan, died within a year of each other a couple years back. This was the beach house was made especially famous because it was featured in the Playboy magazine. <laughs> and you can see some of Bill Morgan's uh, very radical designs that are very much part of the earth. He was very much influenced by uh, prehistoric architecture, pyramids, and tree plant shapes. And truly one of the most remarkable buildings in Jackson was the chart house. We go by it all the time, you don't see it. Designed by a renowned architect named Kendrick Bain Kellogg, uh, and it is a remarkable uh, example part of Oregon Brothers. Another one I'll call out is uh, uh, Ted Pappas' wonderful senior citizen going here in Springfield. Look at this geometry, isn't that cool? That's the real view. Okay, well, I'm going to zip through a little part of it. I want to do one last thing. I know you've been sitting for a long time, and I want to keep it. So I'm going to. This is give you a five and grand finale. <laughs> and I, I promise I will talk about some of the major buildings in Jacksonville. You know, the best way to save building is to save before they're in danger. Many of these buildings are about to go. So we need to pay attention to any Bible school that we make for 30 years. Wonderful classical facade, the building interior bombed out. It just sold last week. It was up for some tax sale. I don't know. I know. Hopefully, somebody will buy it and use this facade and do this building. The old firehouse on Riverside Avenue has been vacant for 20, I guess about 15 years. It's owned by the uh, uh, Fidelity folks, and their plans are to tear it down, but they haven't torn it down yet. It's been sitting there for a long time. The Drew Mansion over in Springfield. Oh my gosh, one of the great architectural gems in Springfield. Been vacant for years and literally fallen apart. A fellow named Michael Gorey bought it about uh, 
three or four years ago with all these great plans to restore it, and it just never got it done. The house is going up for sale next week. So here's Pluto's called Nova, but it's no longer there. Actually, it's here. It is under this skin that was put on in the 1950s. Somebody's going to come along and buy that building, and this is underneath. And we'll have a new Clutho building in our, in our collection. It could be done. There are some contamination issues with Hogan's Creek right there, but there's funding to clear that up once it's done. I'm really hoping this building will come back. It's the old armory sat vacant for years. What a great building. Uh, it's got uh, uh, some flooding issues, but it, it needs to have a good home, a good home. The old Baptist Convention building built by Clutho in the late 20s. Very handsome, uh, uh, it was originally a four story building that had a fifth story. And it's there just decrepit, just, just falling apart on uh, Church Street. Ford Motor Company plan. Mm -hmm. This building is really in danger. It's, it's been used for storage for several decades. A Miami developer just bought this, and his plans are uncertain what to do with it. But this building is one of the coolest buildings in Jackson. It is bigger than three football fields. There's so much that could be done with this, a market, something, a venue. Look at this. They had 10,000 glass windows in the skyline, all of which have been broken up by And the Lawrence Street Trail and Barnett Bank. These buildings have been saved. We have a developer now who's going to do it. The city has finally stepped up to the plate. But this is the sixth developer that's taken on these buildings. And it ain't over until it's over. So I've got fingers crossed. We have an article in this month's Harvest Magazine talking about the renovation and restoration. We will have a uh, Marriott Boutique Hotel and the two skyscrapers, a fabulous restaurant in the Marble Bank, housing, offices, and banks. On the, Bank the Morris Street Trail, let me just get your attention one more moment, is so important. It is unique, perhaps in America, in its organization. Usually on the corner, you have the tallest building. And so you can't see the buildings on either side. But here we have two skyscrapers of similar proportion framing a one-story building so you can see all three buildings as one composition at one time. And because they were designed by our master architect, Clutho, the skyscrapers, this work was very precious. They've been vacant for years. They're too horrible to tear them, to, to leave them that way. And they're too precious architecturally to tear them down. So they must be saved. We've got to keep our fingers crossed. The city will step up to the plate and make this happen. What the heck is that? <laughs> that is the old Jack's Beer Company. Jack's Beer was invented here in Jacksonville and was one of the leading beers in the entire southeast of the United States. And their old manufacturing plant is still out there right next to um, James Weldon Johnson School. And here you see it there with a can of Jack's Beer. It's a huge complex. Something cool can be done with it. Jones Brothers Furniture, a landmark, is now hidden partially by the Skyway. It's nonetheless a beautiful facade. It was a furniture store throughout its life. It's been vacant for many, many years. And I'm worried about that much. These are small shotgun houses that were built during the fire, were close to the fire, and actually caught on fire, but were saved. And they're not being protected by the chain link fence because they slowly crumble into uh, termite hate. This is an amazing complex of building out of Julington Creek designed by Bob Robert. His largest commission, Wesley Manor. This whole complex was designed with a unique construction method using pre um, cast concrete. This is a place for old people. There's not a single step in the entire building. <coughs> We're about to tear all of that down and make high rises. We must stop this, this building. Is it's the largest commission by the highway. Downtown is the high wheel field. I encourage the high wheel field by Marshall. Mark and Sheffield. And it's right between the expressways of State Street and Union Street. And it's been vacant for many years. The old YWCA just went up for sale last week. Not one of Jackson's great towering architectural gems, but nonetheless a nice well-designed building 
that deserves a good home. Uh, here you see an old cabin that was built on Chelsea Street behind uh, where Unity Plaza is. And this was uh, a house that was part of a development of African American soldiers, Union soldiers who stayed in Jacksonville. This is the last remaining one that's on Chelsea Street. And it's a terrible condition. This house is not in a terrible condition in San Marco. It's been torn down. The entire San Marco Historic District is an endangered species. For 20 years I've been preaching to people in San Marco, you must become a historic district to get the protections like Springfield and Riverside Avenue have. But they have refused to do it. And we're going to, we've had over 20 to 30 big mansions in San Marco torn down over the last 10 years. I'll get you a question about it right after we're almost finished. This is a little hidden gem of Art Deco building on Park Street. Owned, it was purchased by Unity Plaza. They planned to tear it down. This is one of the last great Art Deco buildings in Jacksonville. Kind of similar to some of the ones you see on Lima Beach. And I'd love to say that one. It's got put by glass block windows and all the accoutrement of Art Deco. More of an art motor is the Greyhound bus station. This is slated to be torn down once they build the new. Um, transportation center moved by the Prime Model. And what about this? JEA is 50-50 on tearing down the Universal Dairy Building, a very high-level mid-century modern building that we all remember for its rotating Embers restaurant. Uh, if any of you have any influence with JEA, they must fix this building. It's a landmark of downtown. If they don't want it, let them move somewhere else. And this is the most shocking one. Probably the most significant building nationally in Jacksonville is a chart house. We take it for granted. Designed by this great architect, Kendrick Kellogg, and uh, a Miami developer who bought the Ford plant also bought this. It's on that property with the old hotel, just primed for high rise condos. We must have preserved this building. If you look at it from the river, it's a totally different building with this organic shape, looks like a crustacean crawling along the river. <laughs> And if you see it from the air, you see it's an architectural genius. And the interior has hardly any, uh, any flat surfaces and all of these wonderful round laminate wood carved by ship cut. So, Jacksonville has all this architecture. We've lost so much because of fire, because of neglect. And what are we doing? We're building buildings that are not really necessarily going to be thought of as landmarks in the future. We're building huge, the biggest building in construction downtown was built with two by fours. This huge apartment complex like Unity Plaza and all the Brooklyn development. They're building crap. That's all I'm going to say. It's like crap. <laughs> the downtown library has one of the most beautiful interiors, but it's exterior designed by a famous architect, Robert Stern, is boldly callous about what goes on outside. These big blank walls all along Monroe Street is one solid wall with no indentations, no stores, nothing of interest. And although the inside is wonderful, and the people that work there are wonderful, <laughs> the exterior is just a crying shame to us. Spent millions of dollars, we could have, we could have had something great. Not to mention, the great <laughs> this is horrible on so many levels. <laughs> it's huge. It's ugly. It's going to be there for 50 years. What were they thinking? <laughs> Before you spend another taxpayer dollar on a public building, let's do something great. This man, we're going to give him our biggest piece of downtown real estate, the shipyards. Do you trust this man? <laughs> Here is the new amphitheater that he was going to build next to the stadium. But unfortunately, it looks like this. People who are so concerned with the bottom line and forget about the culture and aesthetics of the community are robbing our future, our heritage. We have buildings like the Landing that came here and not only uh, brought new life downtown, but it killed retail downtown because it turned its back on downtown and faced the river. 
drew people out of downtown and all the department stores closed after this building was built. Much like the shipyard, which is not really downtown, but if it, if it gets built too quickly, it will hurt downtown. So instead, here's a design that a friend of mine, architect Brandon Porsche, designed for the landing that has a hotel. It's, it's like a big manta ray. It has a five story aquarium that on top of the aquarium is a swimming pool that you can look down and see the sharks. And it's open to the This building probably won't get built, but why don't we have something that's cool and amazing and iconic to make Jacksonville different from all those other times around cities across the world? It does not have to be the Sydney Opera House. But on the other hand, why not? Why does it have not? Why don't we build something great? This was a, a kind of cool idea that we're going to do a sky tower in downtown Jacksonville with a restaurant on the top. Anything. Give us something that makes Jacksonville appreciate its heritage, its architecture, and respect its future. And some of the buildings we could build on our riverfront. We could build a new museum of science and history on the riverfront that is by an internationally renowned architect or by one of our locally renowned architects that gives us a, a new idea. So Bob Brower said Jacksonville could be one of the great cities in the world. Not the biggest. But in terms of quality of life, of, of beauty, our connection to culture and, and uh, aesthetics, we could be that city. Will we be? I hope and pray to God we will. Thank you so much. Eight months later. 